Hello and welcome back. This is the third chapter of our book, Building Goodwill, the You Attitude, Positive Emphasis, Tone, Power, Politeness, and Bias-Free Language. All absolutely essential topics if you want to succeed at business communication or uh, really more, uh, more to the point, any kind of communication. These are all very important, not just tactics, but ethics to keep in mind as you're communicating with your classmates or your coworkers, eventually uh, colleagues, uh, managers, people under you, you name it. Uh, this is all good stuff to know. Uh, we're going to break this up into four sections, as you can see here. Uh, objectives, creating the you attitude, creating a positive emphasis, improving the tone in business communications, and finally reducing bias in business communications. So, all very worthy objectives, so let's get started. All right, so let's start by talking about goodwill. Uh, you know how important this is for companies, uh, both inter internally and externally. Uh, you can think about externally, how, how many commercials you've seen uh, where the emphasis is on how much that bank cares about you, <laughs> right? Or invest in gold because uh, there'll be somebody there talking about how they uh, they're concerned for you and your family's security, right? That's that's why they're there to get you to uh, invest in gold, right? They have goodwill towards you, and if it works, you you trust that person. You feel like they have your your best interests at heart, and you'll act accordingly. Uh, also internally, uh, the book gave lots of examples of how companies have found big shocker. <laughs> Uh, that if they treat their employees well and everybody's reasonably happy, uh, there'll be a lot more productivity uh, than if people feel like they're unappreciated or overworked, underpaid, and you, you name it, right? Uh, there'll be a lot more turnover. Uh, so it's really in everybody's best interest to build goodwill. And the book gives us three ways to do it. One is the you attitude. The second one is positive emphasis and then lastly is bias-free language. Uh, so we're going to take these one at a time. All right, so let's start by talking about the you attitude. And the book calls this a style of communication that looks at things from the audience's point of view. And this is a really just as basic as it gets in terms of good business communication, effective communication. Uh, the more you know about that audience and, and the more you can tailor your message to accommodate that audience, the more successful you'll be, uh, even if it's, if it's good news, bad news, or whatever it is you're trying to communicate. Uh, if you can really get a good handle on that audience and their expectations, uh, the better off you'll be. Classic case, uh, we, I think I've used this example before, uh, but the uh, let's say you're a student in a class and you know you're going to have to miss a class and you're, you need to email your professor to you know, let him or her know that you're going to miss and, and that you need to uh, somehow make up. Let's say there's going to be a quiz that day, right? So you, you want to get an, ex an extension of some sort so you can make up that quiz. So before you just rattle off an email, you say, well, what would this look like? Let's look at things from that professor's point of view, right? So first and foremost, you're, you're asking, uh, you know, him or her to take some time out of a day, uh, their day, to, to give you this quiz, uh, maybe during uh, some office hours. So it, at the very least, it's going to take some extra time. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to probably interrupt that professor's, uh, professor's schedule somewhat. You know, who knows how many meetings or whatever. They're going to have to uh, rearrange their schedule a little bit to accommodate this. Uh, they might uh, worry about you because uh, you are missing that class period. You'll miss that information, and uh, they want you to succeed, so that, that could be a problem. Uh, so I'm just give, giving you some sort of off-the-cuff stuff, but you could probably sit down and make a, you know, an extensive list of how this uh, professor's point of view will be different than your own. Right from your point of view, this might be a very simple thing. Right? Just <laughs> I need to come in tomorrow and take the quiz. Uh, but if you factor in the stuff I'm telling you, it will help you to shape that email. Uh, you might be aware that, well, okay, this will definitely interrupt this professor's uh, life to some extent. They'll have to take some time out just for me. Uh, they might have to make up a whole new quiz. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot to, you're really asking for quite a bit. And that's okay, but uh, we're, going, <laughs> uh, we're going to keep that in mind when we ask for that extension. 
And the second piece, emphasizing what the audience wants to know. So I'd ask this question, I think, in the a previous uh, lecture, a similar situation to this. And I said, what should you emphasize? And they said that uh, a lot of you said, well, I would emphasize why I had to miss. Uh, well, that certainly uh, is important. I mean, some professors care more than others about, you know, <laughs> I want to see a doctor's note or, or something along those lines. Uh, but I think really just looking at it from my own point of view, uh, what I, what I first of all want to know is, uh, uh, I guess, hmm, it, it can be a tie, I suppose. So the one thing I'd want to know is uh, just basic stuff like uh, <laughs> what class are you in? Uh, what's your name? Uh, I get a lot of emails and they'll just say that they're missing a class and I've got, you know, four classes. So it's it's hard for me uh, to try to figure out, okay, what day is this person going to miss? What class are they in? What What's the number of the quiz they're going to take? And so that's kind of really what I want to know is that, that kind of information. It doesn't, uh, the only thing I want to know about why you're missing is that it's uh, some kind of SS, SESU sanctioned uh, event, maybe you're off with a team, your, your hockey team or whatever, uh, or you're sick. I, I don't really want details, <laughs> the, the gritty details about your illness. <laughs> you know, that's not something that I, I want to know. Uh, yeah, so really, I'm just more concerned with the, you know, when are you going to miss, what class you're in, uh, what's the assignment you're going to miss, and then uh, what, when will you be available uh, to do this uh, this quiz? Uh, third thing, respecting the audience's intelligence. Uh, this is, teaching is a pretty good example of this because uh, a lot of times as a teacher, you're not really sure what the student knows and what the student doesn't know. Uh, so you, you can kind of uh, either go over their heads accidentally or you can just sound like you're being condescending, dumbing everything down, getting uh, really repetitive sometimes. Uh, so this is just something teachers have to struggle with. Uh, struggle with. Uh, but I certainly can think of some strategies. Um, you know, if it's a face-to-face -face situation, you can always just ask, you know, is this, are you familiar with blank? <laughs> and if they say no, well, then, you know, you can go into it. Uh, but if everybody nods, uh, then you can just move on to the next point. Uh, but really, this is more about just not talking down to somebody. Uh, what, there's a tendency, I think, sometimes to just assume that they don't know what, what it is and you're talking to them, giving them information, you're just rehashing stuff. And it's kind of, ins not only is it boring to them because they have to sit through it again, stuff they already know, uh, but it's kind of insulting too. Like you're assuming they didn't know that. Uh, that can be a, that can be problematic. So it's, it's another idea behind goodwill. Uh, I certainly don't see any harm in just asking. Uh, for, for that respecting audience's intelligence again, it would be a little bit disrespectful if, if uh, a student, and when they ask for the quiz, if they uh, copied and pasted some material from the from the uh, you know, student handbook about, <laughs> you know, that uh, I have to give excuse excuses uh, for SESU related activities, you know, that would be uh, insulting on a number of levels, right? It'd be um, uh, not advised at all to, to do something like that. Now, obviously, the professor would, would know all about those policies. Uh, the fourth thing, protecting the audience's ego. Uh, this is actually would definitely come into play, believe it or not, with this, this quiz scenario we've been talking about. Uh, so the professors uh, put a lot of work into these quizzes. Uh, they, they tend to value their class. They think it's important for you to go to their class. Uh, they think it's important for you to take that quiz and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you were to email them and and, may, and imply somehow that uh, you, that class was unimportant really, or that they didn't you didn't mind missing it <laughs> because you had something important to do instead, <laughs> uh, you catch my drift there. Makes it sound like you don't think their class is important. Uh, well, all that all of that stuff could end up being insulting, disrespectful, and end up with. Uh, end up in trouble. So uh, this is the, the key. Look at things from their viewpoint. And if you can really do that, all this other stuff will fit into place. So really the key here is looking at things from their point of view, not necessarily your own. All right, so let's get into the nitty gritty here. Five ways to create the you attitude. 
Talk about the audience, not yourself. Refer to the audience's request or order. In other words, be specific. Don't talk about feelings. In positive situations, use you more often than I, but in negative situations, avoid you. So we're going to take each one of these uh, five ways individually. All right, so let's get into this idea of talking about the audience, not yourself. Now, the first piece here is to tell how the message affects the audience. And this, of course, is a big one. If you get a letter in the mail from a, your bank or an email from your professor or from St. Cloud State or your, your manager, uh, one of the things you might be looking for is, does this actually apply to me? You know, if there's the new, new policy uh, or there's uh, some kind of announcement, uh, we get a lot of irrelevant stuff, right? Uh, so you want to figure out, is this apply to me or not, and if it doesn't, you'll just move on to the next email. Uh, in other words, you're, you're looking for a, a reason you can just count that off as irrelevant and move on. So that, that's part of it. Uh, but also it's important because if you tell the reader uh, how this will affect them, it shows that you, you care about them, right? Or at least you understand their situation. And uh, that makes them feel more comfortable, more, more confident uh, than if they, you know, I guess the worst case scenario, they wouldn't even know uh, let, let's just say this message goes out and it says um, all employees, blah, 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 uh, but it doesn't specify full-time or part-time employees. It just says employees. So you're not sure if it applies to you. Let's say you're part-time. You don't know if it applies to you or not. You don't know if it affects you or how it affects you. Uh, so not only is that confusing, it might actually make you feel like they just don't care or they didn't even think about their part-time employees. Uh, so that would be it'd be a lot better for you if it if that memo or email had said for you know this is how this will affect part-time workers blah 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 this is how it will affect full-time workers blah 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 uh, so you get the idea uh, two don't mention the communicator's work or generosity uh, so again they don't really care about <laughs> the company uh, what this means for the company uh, really we just want to know how to, how does it affect us and stressing what the audience wants to know, uh, again, this is coming back to this uh, part-time, full-time uh, situation. You know, what, what do they want to know about this? So they probably want to know, uh, let's say that there's a holiday coming up and maybe the uh, there's going to be some holiday hours. Well, what would you want to know, right? You, you want to know what, how, how many hours you're going to work that week or if you have to come in at all uh, or how it's going to affect the schedule for that week. Uh, that's what's really important. All right, then let's look at some uh, specific examples of statements lacking that you attitude. So there's two. Uh, let's look at the first one here. Uh, I negotiated an agreement with Apex Rent-A-Car that gives you a discount. So you notice we're talking about I. Uh, there is a you in there, but <laughs> it's at the end. It's the way the sentence is put together is emphasizing that, hey, I negotiated an agreement. Uh, let's look at the second example. Uh, we shipped your May 21st order today. So again, we're starting with we. And when you start with I or we, uh, that doesn't have a very you attitude about it, right? It sounds like it's more of a me or a we attitude. So let's look at how we might fix this. You now get a 20% discount when you rent a car from Apex. So let's just read these again. I negotiated an agreement with Apex Rent-A-Car that gives you a discount. See how that seems to kind of fixate on the I? Now listen to the second one again. You now get a 20% discount when you rent a car from Apex. You know, it's not just that they've put you in there twice. It's that it comes first and that uh, makes it sound uh, like they're putting you first. <laughs> they literally are, right? Now let's look at this uh, second example there. The three coin sets you ordered will ship today and should reach you by June 6. Uh, so this is nice because remember that other slide we were talking about, refer to the order. So if you this first one just says we shipped your May 21st order today. Uh, we don't even, you might not even remember what like what did I order? <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> Uh, here we've got the three coin sets you ordered 
Uh, so this shows uh, that not only are they thinking about you, but they uh, are thinking about your order. And they remember that. They put that there for you uh, to help you remember it too. And so I'm sure you would you can see the advantages of this this second example over this really kind of vague uh, previous one. So just to carry on a little bit about this idea of the request of the order, uh, the main thing is to make specific references, not generic. And I'll give you a good example that happens to me all the time. I get emails from a student and they'll say, uh, Professor, can you help me with the assignment? All right, so I don't know who, <laughs> maybe I don't even know who the student is. They might not even put their name. Sometimes I can't, it's a weird email address their personal email address, so I don't even know who it is. I don't know what class they're referring to. I don't know what assignment they're referring to, and I don't know what they need help with. Uh, so you can see how problematic that is. It'd be really helpful if they mentioned the, who they were, the class they're in, the name of the assignment, uh, the date, if, if that's relevant, and of course, <laughs> what exactly are they having trouble with? Uh, they, some other points they make here is if it's a if it's an order you're dealing with, if it's a one person or a small business, you can do like they did in that previous email and say the, the three coin sets you ordered, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if it's, however, a giant order or it's a repeat order, uh, you don't need to do that. You can just put the uh, purchase order numbers there because they're more, they'll more than likely have all this in their database anyway and can easily bring it up. So let's look at a specific example of this. Uh, this is a one that lacks the U attitude. It just says, we shipped your order today. So we shipped your order today. So remember, they, <laughs> they're starting with we. That's not a good sign, but they're, they're vague about order. And I don't even know how effective today is because, you know, you might not know when, when they're going to read this. Might be better to put a date there, but anyway, uh, let's look at the ones that have the U attitude. The 500 red and gray sweatshirts you ordered were shipped today and you were, and will reach you early next week. So here we have a specific uh, reference to their order, 500 red and gray sweatshirts. Uh, let's look at the second one here. I guess this would be for a bigger business. Uh, your PO 7823N shipped on 11-4 and will arrive within five business days. See, I kind of like this they put the date there instead of just today, but, but maybe that's just me. Uh, but in any case, you can see how one mentions the, uh, the specifics. The other one is vague. Now, so here's one about uh, talking about feelings again. And uh, really the main point here is just not to talk about feelings. You know, maybe you're angry, upset, sad, having a bad day, uh, whatever. Uh, you're better off just keeping that to yourself. Remember, this is a business Con this, these are business contexts we're talking about, professional situations. Uh, it really shouldn't be here nor there. Uh, an example would be, you know, if you're going through the, the bank, uh, interacting with the bank teller, it's, it should be a very standard kind of uh, exchange, right? Good morning. Uh, how are you doing? Here's my paycheck stub or here's my paycheck. Please deposit it. Here's my card, blah, blah, blah. Have a nice day. <laughs> going through a line of the... You go to the store, it's, uh, hi, how are you? Uh, did you find everything okay? Again, have a great day. You know, you get the drill. Uh, it'd be a little strange if they, if you said hi back and they said, and the cashier turned and said, you know, I'm having a terrible day today. <laughs> I'm just uh, coming apart. It's just, uh, I'm so stressed out. Uh, that's not really appropriate, is it? Uh, why are they sharing that with you. You're just a customer at that store. Uh, you have nothing to do with it. You don't know this person. Uh, it's just a little inappropriate for them to be talking about being stressed out, even though it's perfectly true. Uh, it could be not like they're lying. It's just not the right place. It's not the right venue, I guess, uh, for that. Just save it for the break room. <laughs> uh, don't be talking about that kind of stuff uh, with customers. And it, you could extend that same concept to any kind of uh, email exchange or whatever. If it's a business situation, if it's a professional situation, you know, it shouldn't be about feelings. It should just be about the, the facts. Yeah, and this goes uh, with the first one. Don't predict the audience's response. Uh, so if it's good news, bad news, whatever, 
uh, you have to be careful that not you don't just presume uh, how they're going to respond. And, and you've seen this. How many times have you seen this scene in movies or shows, right, where the one person's trying to be understanding and they, they say something like, well, I know exactly how you're feeling. <laughs> you know, and of course, the other person says, no, you don't. You don't know anything. You don't know me. Uh, so that's kind of the, the gist of that second point there. And this third, I'm glad they put this one in uh, because there are some times when it's perfectly accept. Not only is it acceptable, it would be weird not to express feelings. Uh, offering sympathy. You know, if I told, if I uh, told, if you found out somehow that my dog had passed away, and you knew that, and you didn't even, you know, express any sympathy, uh, that would kind of back. It wouldn't. It, what's the word I'm looking for? It would seem kind of a uh, well, not kind of, but uh, majorly insensitive, right? It would seem like you didn't care at all, uh, that you weren't even human, basically. <laughs> so, uh, so this is entirely appropriate. Uh, and congratulations, you know, usually okay for that. You know, if you if you get somebody just graduated and you congratulate them, uh, again, it's one of those situations where it's, it's weirder not to say anything uh, than it is just to say congratulations or uh, maybe send somebody a sympathy card. Uh, it's, it's not so, basically the point of this. What we're saying here with this one is you don't necessarily have to be completely inhuman. It's just that 99% of the time, the uh, the feelings, emotions don't enter into it because it's supposed to be this uh, professional situation. All right, so there's another one of my favorite kinds of slides: the examples. All right, we have two examples here of the lax you attitude. Uh, the first one, we are happy to give you a credit line of $2,000. So again, we're then starting with we instead of you, but also they're talking about emotions there, their feelings. They're happy to do this. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this one does start with you. You will be happy to learn that your reimbursement request has been approved. Well, here you can see how we're kind of assuming they're going to be happy. Uh, maybe they're not happy. Um, <laughs> how do I know what their emotional state is? I, you know, I don't even know why they might have made this request. Uh, so let's look at some ways to fix these. Uh, the first one, instead of we are happy to give you a credit line of $2,000, we say you now have a $2,000 credit line with Visa. And uh, so they just took out the feelings there. They don't say they're happy or that they're sad or that. <laughs> Uh, whatever it is they're feeling, they just say, you now have $2,000. Uh, the second one, your reimbursement request has been approved. So maybe they're happy about this. Uh, maybe they're not, but we're not going to assume either way. We just cut it out. So hopefully that's straightforward enough. And this slide here just basically re reiterates some of the points we've been making. Uh, if it's something positive, you use you because everybody likes to hear good things about themselves. Uh, you really should avoid using I. If you're using I, that means you're back to that uh, me or I uh, instead of the you focus, right? So that's kind of a clue to yourself that uh, you're making it too much about yourself. And this, uh, the we can be weird. Uh, it's basically we is the same thing as I. If you're, if you're saying like we, uh, the professors at St. Cloud State, uh, unless you are a professor, if you're a student and you hear that, then it's basically the same as I because it's excluding you. You're not part of that we. All right, let's look at some examples of this. Uh, lax you attitude. We provide exercise equipment to all employees. So again, hopefully you're getting the idea at this point. Look at how we're starting this. Uh, we who is the we? You're not part of the we. You're excluded from that. Uh, the second example, I will schedule a due date that works best for my, my schedule. <laughs> uh, it doesn't get more uh, me focused than that, right? I will schedule a due date that works best for my schedule. Uh, so how can we fix these? Uh, will you have access to the latest exercise equipment as a full-time employee of BN, BNF? So we're making sure that you are included in that. We get rid of the uh, uh, that bit. And we start with you instead of we. Uh, the second example, we will schedule the due date after we meet. Uh, 
Okay, well, let's move on. This slide is about avoiding you in negative situations. In other words, uh, you made the mistake or you did not follow instructions. So why would you want to avoid this? We, kind of common sense to avoid uh, hurting that person's feelings, protecting their ego, uh, avoid assigning blame, uh, use passive verbs in personal style, talking about things, not people. Um, let's look at some examples of this. You failed to sign your flexible spending account form. You failed to sign your flexible spending account form. I mean, it doesn't really get more negative than you failed. Uh, that just sounds horrible. Uh, you made no allowance for inflation in your estimate. So again, this sounds like you can almost imagine somebody just wagging, wagging their finger at you. Uh, they're looking down on you from on high. <laughs> <laughs> vengeance <laughs> definitely lacking in the you attitude let's look at some alternatives and so instead of uh, you failed to sign your flexible spending account form we get the flexible spending account form was not signed so we don't even say who didn't sign it we just say it was not signed uh, the second one says the estimate makes no allowance for inflation so here we're talking about a thing, the estimate, uh, instead of the person uh, that made that estimate, right? So instead of you, we talk about, we're not even talking about people anymore, right? We've, we've got it abstracted out to a thing, uh, an estimate. And this is, you know, professors will do this instead of saying, you made a bunch of grammar errors in your paper, mister. <laughs> I don't know if any professor would ever put that, but you get the idea. Uh, versus uh, this paper has many grammatical errors. See how you make it about the paper and not about the, the writer. It just kind of softens the blow. I'm not, I'm not, you know, the, it's going to be bad no matter what, but it doesn't have to be mean uh, on top of bad if, if you sort of catch my, my drift there. All right, so going beyond just sentence level things, uh, what are some other things we can do? Uh, obviously, being complete is important. If I give you a set of instructions and I leave off, leave out key steps, that doesn't really show that I have uh, really thought about your viewpoint. Uh, anticipating and answering questions, always a good strategy. Uh, you might even have a, if it's a big enough document, you might, you might even have a section there called frequently asked questions. Uh, showing why information is important. You can't just assume they'll, they'll know that. Uh, show how the subject affects the audience. Again, we're always looking for ways that we can just quickly dis dis dismiss something. You get an email and you're like, oh, this doesn't apply to me. You move on. Uh, that could be bad. So you kind of want to know up front uh, what's important here. Why is, why is it important? How, how does it affect me? And that's the stuff you have to learn how to emphasize. And arranging the info to meet the audience's needs, and this will tie into this uh, last point here about using headings and lists. It's just one of the hard things to transition sometimes from writing long paragraphs uh, in most English classes. But when you get into business class or business writing, then, then suddenly you have all these bulleted lists and numbered lists and you have lots of headings and subheadings and subsections. <laughs> and it can be a little uh, uh, intimidating at first, but really I think it's, it's easier once you get a, ha a handle on this. Uh, but it does make documents a lot easier to read especially if you're saying something like uh, bring you must bring five items to class with you tomorrow and one two three four five you know I, I wouldn't bury that in a paragraph somewhere i would put that on a list and so it's easy to spot and, and come back to all right so let's look at positive emphasis here and if you've ever read uh, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he's, he's really big on this. And just about every self-help uh, motivational speaker, uh, whoever it is, anybody that wants to give you uh, some advantages, ways to get ahead, they'll say the same stuff. It's really better to be a positive person, to focus on the positives. It's not all just sort of, you know, happy world, Disney world <laughs> kind of thinking here. It's just that it gives you advantages uh, in the workplace and maybe even outside the workplace uh, if you're not one of these people that's always dwelling on negative stuff, uh, if you're always complaining, 
uh, if you're always bemoaning your situation, looking at the uh, what's wrong with the world, uh, people just don't you know, want to be around you. And they certainly don't want to put you in a position of authority because uh, all that negativity just kind of trickles down, right? It kind of spreads out. It's just not something you would want uh, in your workplace. And uh, they, I think they do a good job here in this book of talking about this. Uh, but if you really want to take this further, I, I highly recommend that uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People book. It's just a real classic. It will definitely change your, your life uh, if you read that and apply it. But anyway, just looking at situations from a positive perspective, you know, is, is the glass half full or half empty? <laughs> Don't be the person that says it's half empty. You know, focus on the, the fact that it's half full there. Uh, there's so much stuff going on that's, that's going correctly, that's going well. Uh, why fixate on the few things that are going bad? You know, just a classic example is uh, a lot of people will say things like, oh, man, uh, St. Cloud, the, the people can't drive in St. Cloud. Oh, my God, they just can't drive. Uh, wh what do you mean? And really what it is, they've had out of the you know 99% of the cars that they've dealt with on the road, Maybe there's one or two that have acted erratically, uh, that have cut them off or, or just uh, driven poorly. And they're ignoring the fact that almost everybody is fine. <laughs> uh, they're just letting these, these couple of negative uh, drivers, these couple of bad, bad eggs, uh, overshadow all the rest. And you know, that's just a good example of this. And chances are you're probably doing this in all kinds of ways. And you really need to get out of that habit um, you really need to start focusing on the positives. <laughs> You're going to end up being a very unhappy person. Uh, so let's look at some ways to create positive emphasis. We'll talk about words, information, organization, and layout. Uh, so let's look at some ways to create positive emphasis. And we're thinking here about the glass half full scenario again. So what if I'm, what if you're in the position of being a teacher and you have a student uh, that hasn't done well in your class, or it's just not doing well at all. As a matter of fact, it's in danger of failing the class. And you want to you know, communicate effectively with the student. Uh, well, what can you do to create a positive emphasis? So they say, first of all, avoid negative words. Uh, so words like failure <laughs> uh, would go into that list, right? Uh, hearing that kind of word is not going to help anybody. Uh, two, beware of the hidden negatives. So sometimes the word could be on it by itself fine, like acceptable. But if you read the sentence, it might say, this is not acceptable. So again, you can't just look at words, individual words. You have to look at the overall impact. The, the overall message could be negative, even if the individual words are positive. Now focus on what the audience can do, not on the limitations. So again, it wouldn't be helpful for me in that situation where I just keep emphasizing, well, you made an F on this assignment, you made a 12 out of 50 on this, and I just kept talking about uh, the, the stuff you can't change, you know, you can't do anything about those, those are the limitations. Uh, it'd be better off focusing on, you know, what the assignments that are, we haven't gotten to yet, and, uh, you know, if you can make an A on this, if you can do well on this assignment, if you do this, uh, you can do this bonus assignment over here, uh, that's going to be a lot more positive. Uh, and then four, justifying negative information by giving reason or linking to audience benefit. Uh, so this one is probably the hardest thing to do sometimes. Uh, you know, I guess some of the audience benefits for that situation might be, well, well, it's good that you're getting this information now when you still have enough time to uh, turn it around, or, or maybe this will give you, the, you know, some added incentive to go to the right place or whatever it is, or or maybe just, uh, it, could, it could even be, you know, maybe this is a sign that uh, this this class isn't right for you and uh, you, you should go into a different major. <laughs> and this is actually, ultimately, it's to your benefit that you find this out. I think the book gave an example of uh, Warren Buffett saying something along those lines. But, uh, you know, again, that fourth one's a tricky one, right? Uh, the fifth one is... It's kind of interesting, but they find that if you put information in the middle of something, if you have a long speech and you have something in the middle, uh, then people will tend to forget what's in the middle. Right? They're going to remember what was at the beginning and what's at the end. Uh, so they say here, I guess if it's not really all that important, this negative stuff, uh, you could just stick it in the middle somewhere, just put it in there, get it over with quickly, move on uh, to a different topic. 
And that way it just won't seem to be such a big deal. So here's some examples of the negative words. Never fail to return library books on time. Well, got the word fail. That's pretty negative. Uh, because you failed to pay your bill, your account is delinquent. Uh, so there we have failed and this word delinquent. <laughs> Neither one of those sound very nice, do they? Uh, let's omit the negatives. Always return library books on time. The account is past due. All right, let's look at some of these hidden negatives. Uh, so this contains negatives. If, it might not sound so, but just listen to the sentence and then think about sort of what might occur to you. I hope this is the information you wanted. Or I hope this is the information you wanted. Maybe if I say it that way, it's a little, little clearer what I'm getting at. And so if I say, I hope this is, it sounds like there's a pretty good chance it's not, right? So I'm kind of doubting, put some doubt into your mind. Uh, let's look at this example, other one. Please be patient as we switch to the automated system. So again, if I'm telling you to be patient, uh, it's almost like the, the doctor or the dentist telling you to brace yourself. <laughs> uh, you know it's not going to be nice uh, what comes uh, after that. Now, this is why I would say sometimes in resumes and cover letters, if you put statements in there like, I hope you find that I'm qualified for the position, or if you have any trouble understanding my resume, uh, if you put something in there like that, it sounds like even you think there's a good chance that it's confusing or it's poorly done. Uh, and there's just no reason to put that in there. So let's look, look at some alternatives. <clears throat> Instead of just saying, I hope this is the information you wanted, and to say, enclosed is a brochure about joining the Retiree Association. Or the second one, you'll be able to get information instantly about any house on the market once the automated system is in place. If you have questions during the transition, please call, call Cheryl Brown. So you kind of read between the lines here and figure out, well, okay, before it gets in place, there might be some issues, but it's not emphasizing it. All right, and let's look at some examples of what the audience can do. So negative, you will not get your refund check until you submit your official grade report at the end of the semester. And this one is better. To receive your refund check, submit your official grade report at the end of the semester. So you see how this first one doesn't really emphasize uh, what you can do. It just says, until you submit your official grade report, something won't happen. Uh, consider how this one makes it a lot more clear what you can do about it. So to receive your refund check, submit your official grade report. All right, so let's see what we think about these. So if you have to give some negative information, uh, they said you can couch it with some kind of a, a audience benefit. Uh, so this is uh, the negative one, completely negative. Uh, you cannot take vacation days without prior approval from your supervisor. Uh, so that's, that's factual, but it doesn't really you don't have any uh, anything in there for us. It's just kind of all negative. Let's see if we can look at the second one to see where they put in the audience benefit or at least a reason. Uh, to ensure that everyone's duties will be covered, submit your first and second choices of vacation time to your supervisor by May 30th. Uh, so really, if you look at this first part, it says it's still saying basically the same thing. But here we say to ensure that everyone's duties will be covered. And so that gives the audience a reason for this policy instead of just stating it as basically a command. All right, then we mentioned this about how you can put the negatives in the middle somewhere. Uh, don't put it at the bottom of page one. This is, I hadn't read this piece of advice before, uh, but they're saying if you've got a multi-page document, and let's say this is the bottom of the document here, uh, that first page, uh, since it is the first page, uh, this piece at the bottom will stand out, uh, even if it's technically the middle of the document itself. So there might be more pages here, you know, and so on. But uh, uh, this little spot here will still stand out. So that's why they're saying don't put it there. <laughs> don't present with bulleted or numbered lists. <laughs> As you could imagine, if I said something like there are five 
five reasons you're going to fail my class. And one, two, three. I mean, that would just really be emphasizing the, the heck out of it. Uh, clearly wouldn't want to do that. Uh, make it short as you can. Again, nobody wants to dwell on, and you shouldn't want to either, dwell on something negative. <laughs> Give it only once. You know, again, good advice. All right, so let's talk now about tone, power, and politeness. And I find this is what gets more students into trouble than anything else. And you've probably seen co this, this is the bane of many of your coworkers and colleagues, I'm, I'm sure, too. But what we mean by tone is the impl implied attitude of the communicator toward the audience. And sometimes uh, this people are aware of their tone, and sometimes they're not. So you might remember being a kid and your, your parents might have told you, watch your tone. And maybe you thought, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, I, did, I wasn't aware that I was, uh, you know, getting myself into trouble here. What, what, what did I say? And then your parents might explain. So it could be that, you know, of course, it could just be you just really have no respect for your parents and you want them to know it and you don't mind if you get in trouble. Uh, but more than likely, it's just uh, you're not aware uh, of how you can be coming across sometimes. Uh, so let's just think about good tone in the business scenario, obviously business-like, uh, but not stiff. You know, there's, this is a little tricky sometimes to, to find the right balance here. Uh, you know, obviously if you're, if you're so business-like, we're to the point where you're not <laughs> congratulating somebody on their, <laughs> their wedding, <laughs> uh, that would come across very stiff. If you never smile, uh, that's stiff, right? Yeah, yeah, look, friendly, but not phony. And we always know the difference, you know. Uh, it, bugs some, it bugs me sometimes uh, when you go through a bank teller or, or there's a place, uh, Famous Dave, Famous Dave's uh, a barbecue place here in St. Cloud. Uh, they, they try to be friendly, but I feel like they kind of overdo it sometimes. And they just, <laughs> you know, they're acting like they're your best friend or something. Uh, it just seems really phony. Uh, I would prefer friendly, not phony. Uh, let's see, confident, not arrogant, another difficult thing to manage sometimes. Uh, so you don't want to come across as though you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but on the other hand, if you, if you sound like, uh, you know, if you take it too far, you can even sound like you're questioning somebody's uh, opinion who might uh, know more about it than you do. So, for example, I, I deal with this sometimes with, with students in terms of their uh, resumes or essays, let's say. Uh, so they'll say, well, I know this is a, this is a perfect resume. Well, that just comes across as, as arrogant. You know, how, how could they know that? It's, it's kind of too much. Uh, it'd be fine if they said, I'm confident in this resume, or I, I've done the best. I feel like this is a good resume. Uh, that, that's fine. Just don't take it too, <laughs> too far. Uh, and the last one's kind of tricky for people too. Uh, polite, not groveling. Uh, I don't know too many people that grovel, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know you could you, you've probably seen students sometimes that just seem like they're and you might call it sucking up, right? It's just like they're, they're being too complimentary. They're they're being too it's just too much. Uh, again, it's, it's just stepping over some kind of line, and so it's not that I'm saying be rude, uh, just be somewhere in between all these uh, extremes. All right, so let's look at some ex examples of this. And of course, one of the things to consider is what what are your respective ranks or positions, right? Is this a, are you a manager talking to uh, an employee? Are you a professor talking to a student? Or are you a student talking to a professor or an employee talking to a manager? Or, uh, you know, like the, an entry level, <laughs> entry level employee talking to the big boss. I uh, said so there's all these different levels and they're appropriate at different times. So let's just take a look at some of these. Uh, so the highest level, would you be able to complete your report by Friday? Would you be able to complete your report by Friday? You see, this is about as innocent as you can get, right? So we're asking it as a question. We're not being demanding here at all. Uh, basically, you're being as nice as you possibly can about this. Uh, but it also might come across as you're kind of weak, right? That you don't really have any power to enforce anything. Uh, so you're basically just asking asking for a favor like would you be able to complete your report by Friday that you know it doesn't sound like you're uh, in much of a position of authority uh, a high level progress report should be turned in by Friday 
Uh, so this is a little bit more forceful, I guess. Uh, progress reports should be turned in by Friday. So you're not posing this as a question. You're telling them when they should be turned in. Uh, Mid-level, please turn in your progress report by Friday. You know, I'm not quite sure what to make of this one. I think by saying please there, you know, it sounds like you're kind of, again, it's almost like you're asking for a favor. You know, you like it. You like this to happen. Uh, and then the lowest level is just turn in your progress report by Friday. Uh, so you could imagine a, you know, say if you're the captain, <laughs> you say turn in your progress report by Friday. Uh, if you're of equal, equal rank, you might say, please turn in your report by Friday. And then if you're speaking to somebody that's superior to you, you'd probably want to use this highest or high, you know, phrase it as a question. Uh, you definitely don't want to sound like you're giving orders to somebody that's supposed to give you orders, if that makes any sense. So now we get to the section on bias-free language. And talking about uh, words uh, that discriminate, or rather how to choose words that do not discriminate on the basis of sex, age, ethnicity, race, physical, uh, physical condition, and religion. Uh, so the first one was uh, uh, sex language. So what we want to do is treat both sexes or, or uh, uh, treat both sexes neutrally. And some words don't do that, right? The word like businessman uh, arguably implies that uh, you're suggesting that only men uh, should do business, right? And there should be women involved. That's, that's, that's kind of the assumption built into that word. Uh, so we prefer business person. Uh, same with uh, things saying woman doctor, uh, woman lawyer, uh, whatever. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant, really, the gender there. Uh, so you just say doctor. And then there's some words that are just, there's really no <laughs> way to spin it. It's just, uh, seems very sexist to say. Uh, I need somebody to man the desk or man the reception area, whatever. Uh, man the console. Uh, it's got the word you know, man built into it. So I just want to get rid of that to say something like staffing. Uh, along with this is the assumption that everyone's heterosexual or married. Uh, so you can imagine if you're giving a speech or sending out a, a newsletter or a letter to your, uh, your clients or your customer base, whatever. You don't want to imply in there that everybody is uh, heterosexual or that everyone's married or should be married or should want to be. Uh, so you just want to be wary of that. You can, a lot of people, of course, are gay or are not married and, and don't plan to be. And, and there's, you, should, should, you, you don't want to suggest there's something wrong with either of those. Okay, making language non-sexist continue. Uh, avoid sexist job titles. Uh, words like actress are no longer used. We just say actor. Uh, repairman, chairman, all these, uh, they got it underlined already there with the man. If it's got man on the like salesman, you probably want to change that to salesperson. Or find uh, what the company prefers, uh, foreman, waitress. Oh, waitress, uh, you don't want to say waiter and waitress, you just say server. Okay, uh, let's see. A little bit more on this, it's quite a bit. <laughs> um, and we're talking here about the titles in a letter, the salutation, where you'd say, Dear Miss Smith, uh, Dear Mr. Jones, whatever. Uh, there's uh, some older traditions that can come into play with with uh, uh, women titles. There's um, Let's start with the early ones. Uh, so M-I-S-S -S meant a single woman, and M-R-S period meant married woman. And these are both pretty much obsolete now, but every now and then you'll find somebody that prefers one of these. And if they say, please call me Miss, or Mrs., obviously you'd want to, to do that. Um, but the more modern one is MS, period, because they this one doesn't imply anything about marriage, right? And it's, well, it's usually not relevant whether somebody's married or not. That, sh that shouldn't be part of the, it's really nobody's business, basically. So you just use the Ms. Uh, unless um, they have a professional title. So it could be anything from, say, doctor, or if you find out... Um, job title like human resources manager or something like that. You could just use that professional title, not not to worry about this Mr. or Ms. business. I determine the proper courtesy title for address and salutation. Uh, so one way to do this would be just look, see if there's a company website would list the, uh, uh, the staff or the employees, managers, whatever you might see. Uh, Maybe this person here has a job title like human resources manager. 
Uh, so you can determine what that is and, and how to address uh, the person properly. And let's see, omit sexist generic pronouns. Yeah, you probably didn't do that. Uh, this is kind of archaic, but it used to be that you'd say something like, uh, everybody in the class should bring uh, his book. And the idea was, well, what there's women in the class? And they say, well, the, it's just a generic pronoun, he, uh, so it's okay. But nowadays, uh, that's, <laughs> uh, we don't do that. You'd say his or her, or use a plural uh, form instead. Or really just, a lot of people nowadays are just using their and they. Yeah, sometimes it's not grammatically correct, but it avoids that issue, and that's why it's preferable. Well, let's see what we have here, non-racist and non-ageist. Uh, and non-ageist would mean discriminating uh, based on age. Uh, so it's usually, yeah, give age or race only if it's relevant. Uh, so most of the time, it's it's not an issue. There's no reason to bring it up. So why bring it up and risk uh, offending somebody? Uh, sometimes it is relevant. You know, certain jobs where there's ages, you can only do the job if you're within a certain age bracket, for example. That might be an issue, uh, but usually it's not. Oh, let's see, sorry about that. Uh, uh, refer to a group by the term it prefers. So um, this could be, say, a Native American group. Uh, I think the book was talking about whether you should use black or African American was the example, or Latino, Latina. And the idea here is instead of just trying to decide that for yourself, you want to figure out what your audience prefers, right? So if your audience tells you, I, I prefer black, uh, just that's fine. Well, that's what you would use. I uh, don't suggest competence is rare. Uh, so this is another kind of more subtle way to be uh, discriminatory. Uh, so if you said, the example here, she is an asset to her race. So again, this is this kind of violates this first principle. Why is that relevant? Uh, this whole thing, I would just forget about it. Uh, he is an active 83 year old. Uh, so with this one, you're kind of implying that 83-year-olds uh, 83, 83 aren't normally active. And so this person stands out somehow. And that's kind of a more subtle form, but it's still considered uh, discriminatory. So just avoid all those. Uh, so this one's about people with disabilities and, and diseases. And, and this is another uh, group that get discriminated against a lot with word choices and language. If you say this, this person is confined to a wheelchair, or I refer to him as uh, handicapped or something. Uh, that would be uh, discriminatory. And the reason is uh, they're putting the disability uh, first. Uh, what we really don't want to do is put the people first. Uh, so we name the person first and then only add disability or the disease if it was <laughs> relevant. Uh, so there's no reason to bring it up, no reason to mention it, to mention it. Uh, and don't imply the disability or disease uh, defines of the person uh, so if you said something like, um, well, let's talk about the blind for, for a moment. See, with something like that, you're implying that being blind defines a whole group of people. Uh, so that's why you'd say, put the people first. You might say um, people with a visual impairment. Uh, so you're emphasizing that the people, that they're not, uh, they're not disability or disease. Uh, and then avoiding negative terms. So uh, confined uh, to a wheelchair sounds very negative. Uh, this person uh, here might not even feel that way about it. Might not even be like a negative. Uh, so think about a different word choice. Uh, they, do, they do mention here that sometimes your audience might prefer one of these uh, terms. So, so if you're saying hard hearing, they might just say, well, just you know, just call it just call it deaf. I'm fine with deaf. Uh, so whatever it is, you, you kind of want to uh, pay attention to what they prefer and go with that. All right, and then it's the same sort of thing goes on with photos and illustrations. Uh, so a lot of companies, when they send out a flyer, advertisement, uh, you can flip through the newspaper and find all kinds of ads, right? And they'll, they'll have pictures there, and the pictures might be representing their customer base. Uh, or you can imagine like a St. Cloud State advertising campaign where they'd have, they'd probably want to have pictures of the sports teams and uh, just some shots of students out having fun, or maybe students in classes or whatever. And that's just normal, expected. Now, the problem is you have to pay attention to uh, what those photos are suggesting uh, about sex and race. Uh, so, for example, if you had uh, all uh, all guys in the photos or all girls in the photos or all um, white people in the photos, it might seem like 
uh, you're suggesting something there, right? Uh, so you want to be wary of that. Uh, they talk about a sprinkling of various kinds of people. Uh, so if you've got a, a campus that, if the photos are intended to show just typical, you know, campus uh, activities or whatever, and you have say, um, I can't say 20% African American students on campus, oh, you don't want to make sure those are represented in photos. Uh, it's okay to have individual. Is it okay to have individual pictures that have just one sex or, or one race? You know, of course it is. Uh, if you just want to draw attention to one student, you know, there's, <laughs> it's not like you have to put in a bunch of uh, other people. Uh, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, check relationships and authority figures as well as numbers. Uh, so this would come more into play if you imagine something like a company manual, policies, uh, instructions, or maybe a textbook, and and you're showing. Uh, like this, uh, maybe you want to have a photo that of CEOs. You know, here are, here's a typical CEO, and you got a guy, a white guy there, and then you say, here's a typical um, a receptionist, and, and then you've got a a woman there. Uh, so with that, you're kind of implying you might not be thinking this, but you're kind of implying that there's a, you know, it's pro this is appropriate for these uh, genders. Uh, so you don't want to watch that. Make sure you're not making those kinds of suggestions and. Uh, same thing with the uh, numbers of people. You know, if you have a, a photo and you've, you've got a whole bunch, uh, let's say you've got nursing nursing students run into this sometimes, right? So there's this long, uh, this long held idea that uh, nurses should be women and men shouldn't be nurses. Uh, it's of course obsolete. That's <laughs> pretty obsolete nowadays. It's, it seems like it's still hanging around that idea. Uh, so if I had a photo of nursing nursing students at St. Cloud State, and I had maybe 100 women in the photo and like two guys. Now, again, I'll be suggesting something. So you really need to be careful with the uh, these photos and illustrations. Be aware of what kind of uh, hidden assumptions you might be uh, sending out with that photo.